I've, I've seen that, I don't know, a dozen times, and I still get emotional looking at it. I feel like we've been to church already, and I haven't even started preaching, but uh, you've got to listen to me still. Just what a great day that was, um, full of God's grace and goodness to us, and I'm so grateful for all of you who made that happen. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us. Father, thank you for this morning, and we thank you for your word, which is living and active, and we desperately need it. So open our hearts and open your word to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As I mentioned, we begin a new series today called With Jesus, and what does it mean really to live life with him? Every time in the Gospels, in the New Testament, Jesus calls someone to follow him. It's not, like it's, we, it, he's, it's not a part-time thing. He's not saying, follow me, you know, from 9 to 5, and then you can go home to your family, and then I'll see you again in the morning, or follow me during these classes. He's saying, spend your life with me 24-7. Live with me, observe me, walk with me, learn from me. Not just listen to my teachings, you know, one hour a week on Sunday, but live with me. And I, I've been thinking about what does it mean to, to live that way for us today? How do we think about following Jesus or being with him? In fact, there's a little story in John chapter 1, you can turn there if you have your Bibles, it'll be on the screen, of Jesus calling some of the first disciples. This is the story of John the Baptist who sees Jesus and his followers, John's followers, he speaks to them about, about who Jesus is and there's an interesting encounter that happens after that. John 1 verses 35 to 42. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Now, I find that funny, that part right there. They, they hear from their master they're, when they're following John the Baptist that that's the guy, the Lamb of God. So they follow him. And then Jesus turns around, sees him following, and goes, what do you want? I think they were like shocked. Uh, 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 where are you staying? What a funny thing to ask. <laughs> uh, where are you going? Where are you staying? And Jesus says to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and follow Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John, but you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter, a rock. What a great little story. Do you notice in verse 39, this phrase, when they said, Where are you staying? And Jesus says, Well, follow me and you'll find out. And they do follow him, that they spend the day with him. Did you catch that? They spent the day with him. How many of you would like to spend a day with Jesus? Just a day? Not to give your life away, just a day to hang out with Jesus. If your hand's not up, you've got issues, right? I mean, wouldn't that be amazing? Just one day hanging with Jesus. You know, go out to eat, get some good barbecue with Jesus, watch some Netflix with Jesus, play Xbox with Jesus, go to a ball game with Jesus, just whatever you wanted to do, you and Jesus, one day to hang out. Or whatever he wants to do, probably. One day with Jesus. And I think we tend to think of living with Jesus like that. He's my buddy. We hang out. He's always there for me. He's always encouraging. He says nice things, and, he's all, and it never, you know, he makes me feel good, and he helps me out in my life, and I can count on him. And there's some truth in that. But that's not really what Jesus is calling these disciples, these first disciples and us, to do. He's not just your buddy. He's not just going to hang out with you. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, when God calls a man, he bids him come and die. Yeah. This is the call to be with Jesus. The call to be with Jesus. What is this call? I want you to think about the way we tend to think of it as we read this next passage, where we'll spend most of our time this morning, from Luke chapter 14. It's going to feel a little different than hanging out with Jesus for a day. The verses 25 through 33. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. 
Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. What? Wait, what? What happened to hanging out with Jesus for a day? What happened to Jesus, my buddy? What is this business about hate your father, hate your mother, hate your brothers and sisters, hate your own life, give up everything, or you can't be his disciple with Jesus? I mean, come on, Jesus. We really like your teachings about love your neighbor as yourself. I really like the stuff about forgive those who have wronged you, especially when I'm the one who needs forgiveness. I'm all for that. But this just sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? This just sounds extreme. What in the world? This should make you squirm. And I think Jesus intends to make us squirm a little bit. And I think our squirming is largely because there's some fundamental misunderstandings we all have about who Jesus is and what he really is up to. We tend to think about it in terms of our cultural context. The midterm elections are coming up in November 2018, this year, and you're going to begin to hear a whole bunch of uh, platforms being put forward, aren't you? You're going to hear uh, some, see some ads tearing down other politicians and building others up, and you're going to hear people talk about certain things. And what are they all doing? What are they all, what's the goal of all of this political posturing? They're trying to what? Get your vote, to win your allegiance and to get your vote. So they're going to say things they think you want to hear. We think of Jesus this way. We wouldn't say it. But subconsciously, I think many of us think of Jesus as somebody trying to win your vote, somebody trying to convince you that he's worth it. But this is not who he is, and this is not at all what he's up to. I mean, if Jesus were a politician, this is a terrible stump speech. Think about it. Hate your father, hate your mother, hate your brother, hate your sister, give up everything and vote for me. <laughs> not that guy, right? Can you imagine a politician that actually told the truth today? Listen. It's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Some of you are going to go bankrupt. The country is in real trouble. Many of you might even die, right? There's a platform for you. <laughs> this guy's not getting elected. This is not what Jesus is after. He's not trying to win your vote. See, we think of it like this. I've got a vision in my head of what the good life should be. So do you. And I want people in positions of power politically, financially, and every other way that will serve in some way my vision of what the good life is, that will work for my agenda, that will make my life better, and the people that I care that are around me. This is how we all think subconsciously. But this is not who Jesus is. Jesus is not working in service of your vision of the good life. He's inviting you into his life, which is radically different. He does have your long-term good in mind, but it means he's going to ask you to do some things that will be uncomfortable in the short term, that will require sacrifice, that won't even make sense. Think of how ridiculous to think Jesus is working in service of my agenda to help me out. And here's one of the ways you know you're slipping into think, misunderstanding Jesus. When your life begins to unravel relationally, financially, in your career, whatever way. When you're deeply disappointed and there's pain and struggle and things aren't working out at all the way you had planned, do you begin to think, come on, God, what are you doing? I mean, I voted for you, Jesus. I go to church. I put something in the plate. I'm doing some service. I went to that big thing and sweated outside last week. I mean, where are you, God? What are you doing? Why aren't you coming through for me? You wouldn't say it that way, but we tend to think this way. That's, how, that's the, how I know. If I begin to grumble and complain and feel like I deserve more and things aren't working out and it's unfair, then I know and, and, and blame God, I know I'm slipping into misunderstanding who he is. He has your good in mind, your long-term ultimate good. So we're going to go back and examine this text again. And I want you to remember, Jesus is not a politician trying to win your vote. He's someone who knows what you don't know about life. He's trying to tell you the truth and invite you into his life. 
So as we go back and examine this passage, let's keep that in mind. Notice verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them. That's really important to understand this passage. Whenever you hear Jesus saying things you don't initially get, you should examine for the context. Where is he? Who's he talking to? Great crowds accompanied him. Now, in, the, in Luke's gospel, in Luke chapter 9, we read a little interesting passage that says Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. That means he's on his way to the holy city for the last time, and he knows he's going to be betrayed, suffer, and die there. So from Luke 9 to Luke 17, there's this progression in Jesus' life where he's moving from town to town, village to village, but he's making his way slowly toward Jerusalem, where he knows the end will come. So the things he's saying are in this part of his life. They're intentional. And in Luke 13, we're told that he goes everywhere he went, from village to village, town to town, huge crowds gathered around him because word is spreading. He's healed people. He's brought the dead back to life. He's made the blind see. He's an amazing teacher. He teaches with great authority. And people are coming and flocking to be around him. There's a huge crowd. And he's speaking to the crowd. That's very important for us to understand. There are people in the crowd who are excited about Jesus. There's a buzz and energy. And there are people in the crowd who have their own agendas for Jesus. Some of them are faithful Jews thinking, yes, throw out the Romans, reestablish David's throne, bring Israel back into power, finally. Others are thinking, I saw you heal that guy's mother, and can you do that for my wife? Meet my needs. Others are themselves suffering. Others are just curious. I want to hear what this guy has to say. They're always following the latest new ideas of the day, right? There's all kinds of people in the crowd who have their own agendas for Jesus. But let me ask you a question. Does that mean that everyone in the crowd is really his follower? I mean, they're following him physically, but are they his followers? Not at all. And friends, I look out this morning and the same thing is true right here. You can be in the crowd. You can be every week in service and not really be following Jesus not really be living with him. It's a difference. And I think what Jesus is saying here is intentionally challenging, shocking, offensive to sift the crowd, to differentiate between those that are just in the crowd and those that want to follow him, be his disciples. That word disciple is an interesting word. It, It means student or learner or apprentice. In Greek, the word is methetes, and it literally means one bound to his master and his master's teaching. There's a difference between being a disciple, living with Jesus, and just being in the crowd. I think about that all the time, and it comes to my own life and our church. You heard Chuck, uh, who was baptized there. You saw him get baptized. He said, I knew that this was my birthday, my mom's birthday. It was my time. I know Chuck well. And he was talking about that. He said, when I said, some of you intellectually believe in Jesus, but you've never surrendered, he goes, I knew that was me. There's a difference right there between being in the crowd and being a follower. You don't just happen to become a follower. It doesn't happen accidentally. The drift of your life is not into becoming a true disciple. You drift the other direction. You drift with the crowd. So why does Jesus begin with such a shocking statement in verse 26? Hate your parents. Hate your siblings. Hate your own life. I mean, couldn't he soften it a little bit? Couldn't he ease into this thing? And quite frankly, Pastor Brian and I were debating, maybe we shouldn't start with this text in this new series. If we want people to come back. Maybe we should pick a nicer one, a softer one. But there's a reason for this. I want you to understand what he's talking about, what he wants for you. So he says hate. Now, even in English, the words love and hate, we don't use literally all the time, do we? We use them in different ways. How many of you love Chicago-style pizza? I, I do. Put your hands up, people. Right? Right? How many of you love bacon? Now, some of you out there are vegans are like, oh, where is this going? This is not spiritual at all. How many of you love essential oils? Yeah, okay, I know. You just exposed yourselves. Okay, anyway, what are we talking about? Right, so if I say I love bacon and I love my wife and I mean the same thing by both, I'm going to have a lousy marriage or... There's something seriously wrong with my relationship to bacon. (laughs) They can't mean the same thing, right? I mean, I like bacon. I prefer it on everything. But I've made vows to my wife. There's a difference in the way we use the words. We understand that. You understand that. Love is almost meaningless in our culture because we use it in so many different ways. So when Jesus says hate, love and hate here in this passage, 
it's, he's not, he doesn't mean literally. He's using it in a way that was common in the rabbinic language of his day. Love and hate in Jesus' day were often used, not exclusively, but often used as a way of talking about your ultimate allegiance to someone or something. For example, in Luke 16, verse 13, Jesus' famous talk about money. He says, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, you hear it, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. What's he talking about? No, you cannot serve both God and money. Ultimate allegiance, do you hear it? Do you see it there in this teaching? Love and hate, meaning, what is Jesus saying? You should hate your money? Pull out your money? I hate your money. I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. Like, what does he mean, hate? No, he means you can't have both on the throne of your heart. You have to choose. There's only one seat there. Only one person or thing gets placed there. And God is saying you can't have two masters. So when you put Christ there, you, he's your ultimate love, your ultimate allegiance. And by comparison, your secondary loves are almost like you hate them. You don't emotionally hate them, but by comparison. Does that make sense? So when he's not saying that you should emotionally hate your family. He's not saying, go home t- today, call your parents, mom and dad, I could never love you as much as I love Jesus. Click, never talk to him again, right? It's <laughs> not what he's saying. It's ridiculous. What he's saying is, you can't, you can only have one Lord. And some of you put your family on the throne of your heart. You put your family and tribe there. Your children there. Your spouse there. The love of the people around you there. And it won't work. He's saying it just won't work. Being with Jesus means he is your ultimate allegiance. He's first. Above all else. Everyone else. That sounds right intellectually. Profoundly difficult to live that way in our culture. Now remember, he's not an arrogant politician. If this was a human politician, this is the height of arrogance, right? I must be first, people. (laughs) I'm not voting for that guy. But he's not. He's someone who knows about the things about life you don't know. He's trying to tell you the truth. He's not insecure. He knows, ultimately speaking, if you put anything other than him on the throne of your heart, you're going to be miserable. It's not going to work out. C.S. Lewis wrote an essay called First and Second Things. He says, put first things first and you get second things thrown in. Put second things first and you miss both. I think he's exactly right. He's echoing what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Lewis says, if you aim at heaven, you get earth thrown in. If you aim at earth, you miss out on both heaven and earth. This is what Jesus is saying here with this love and hate language. And look at what he does then. He takes the two great idols of the human heart and he totally deconstructs them and demotes them. First, family and tribe, right? In, 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 hate your father, mother, sister, brother. Ugh, sounds crazy, but we've talked about what he means. In traditional cultures, everything's about the family. Not just in Jesus' day in the ancient Near Eastern culture, but today in traditional cultures. Everything's about family honor, family name, family respect and prestige. Marriages are arranged based on the promotion of the family. When you get married, you don't build a house in another part of the country. You build it in the family compound. You serve the family business. It's all, your identity is wrapped up in your allegiance to the family. That was certainly true in Jesus' day, and he's totally undoing that. But then he says, notice what else he says in verse 26. And even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That is the shocking one for our culture. The other great idol of human history is self. Can you think of a culture where self is king and queen? I mean, can you think of a culture in recent human history where people live in service to self, self self-actualization, self-fulfillment, self-desires? You know, maybe they hire like life coaches or instructors or therapists to help them build the best self they can, have the best life they possibly can. I don't know. Maybe you could think of a culture like this where people, they move from town to town and job to job looking for fulfillment, church to church, because this church meets my emotional and spiritual needs in this season of my life, but it won't forever. And ooh, I like that church over there. I'm going to go over there because this makes me feel better about me right? I'm not, this is our, this is our culture, friends, if you're, a lot of blank stares here, right? This is the world we live in. 
where self reigns. And Jesus is saying, like, whether you put your family and tribe, he doesn't just mean your nuclear family, he means like your associations. Or you put yourself on the throne of your heart, you're headed for trouble. You're headed for destruction. You're headed for pain. He's not trying to rob your happiness or take something away from you. He's trying to warn you. Good things elevated to the place of God in our hearts become bad things. And we have the cult of family, too, in our culture, don't we? I'm in the last season as a father watching my son play football at Wheaton College. Sat in the stands yesterday. That's why my face is red. <laughs> it's, la- it's come end of an era, right? I spent a lot of time cheering and driving home, feeling my identity wrapped up in how well he did, we did, they did, you know. It's all confused in my head, some, in my heart sometimes. Now that it's almost over, I'm beginning to gain perspective. You don't believe that there's children or idols in our culture? Just after you're done here, drive out to any soccer field, baseball field, or marriage. My spouse will complete me and perfect me. Or if you're single, my future spouse. That's the thing I'm living for. Whatever it is, right? Jesus is saying, whatever is there, take that thing, that person, that goal off the throne of your heart. It's going to destroy you. Put me there. And the beautiful thing is when we do that, our other allegiances, our other loves, they come into their proper place. They, 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 they find their true meaning in our lives if Christ is first. I see it all the time in marriage counseling where a couple comes in and it's like, well, he's not this and she's not that. And they're trying to extract from a human being what only God can be for them. And therefore, they're missing out on what God wants to give them because they're trying to get it from the wrong place. And they can't have their wife or husband be for them what God intends because they're trying to get something they can't get from them. Does that make sense? This is what Jesus is saying here. You want to follow me? You want to live with me? You want to come out from the crowd and join the life that I'm inviting you to? I must be first in your heart. That's where it starts. If you want to read a book that's, uh, I think, outstanding on this, this topic, Timothy Keller's short book called Counterfeit Gods is outstanding. He deconstructs the false gods in our culture and our own hearts. It's been helpful to me, and I would recommend it to you. Jesus is saying that we do not accidentally drift into discipleship. Let's go back for a minute and look at verses uh, 28 to 32 of the text. It won't be on the screen, but I'll read it for you. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation, is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, does not first sit down and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet the one who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. This is an interesting little turn here Jesus makes and tells two little back-to-back short parables about a builder and a king who have to count the cost of the building project and the battle they're about to engage in. Counting the cost. What he's saying is, if you want to follow me, you must make an intentional decision to respond to my call to come out from the crowd and follow me. And to do that, you've got to do some math. You've got to sit down and count the cost. You've got to think it through. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship, where he talks about this. Dallas Willard has a phrase called The Cost of Non-Discipleship. Yes, yes, it costs us to follow Jesus, but we also need to consider what it is we're gaining. People on their wedding day, I've never done a a wedding ceremony with a husband and wife sitting there thinking and talking about how much they're giving up. You know, it's, it's a lot to ask, but I guess right? No, they're thinking, she's worth it. He's worth it. I want this relationship, and the cost is nothing to me. That's the, that's the invitation, friends. Is he worth it? Whatever he asks, is he worth it? And in fact, when Jesus says, cannot be my disciple, do you notice that three times he says, you cannot be my disciple? If you don't hate your father and mother, hate yourself, take up your own cross, you cannot We read that and think he's not going to allow you to. Isn't that how it sounds to you? Jesus is saying, I won't let you in. That's not what he's saying. He doesn't mean permission. He means possibility. So he's not saying, I won't permit you. He's saying it's not possible. 
So he's not saying you can't come in unless you pay the price. That's not what he's saying. He's saying it's not even possible to have this conversation unless you understand this fundamental principle that I must be first in your heart. That's what following me is. That's what it means. But there's something else in here that I've never, I've not seen before preparing for this sermon. In these two little stories, do you notice with the builder and the king, both of them sit down to count the cost and what do they realize in Jesus' parable when they count the cost? Jesus does not tell the story this way and I think it's important. Jesus doesn't do anything unintentionally, right? So when he tells the story, he doesn't put it this way. What builder sits down to count the cost of the building project and realizes, oh, I've got more than enough, this will be a breeze and takes care of the project. What king, who before he goes off to war, doesn't sit down to count the cost and realize, I have 20,000, I'm going to wipe them out. He doesn't tell it that way, does he? What happens to both the builder and the king? They don't have enough. In both cases, in his little parables, both the builder and the king sit down to count the cost and they realize, ooh, we've come up short. Why does Jesus tell it that way? I've been thinking about this. I think he's trying to say something directly to us. He's saying, you want to follow me? You must intentionally answer my call. And you're going to have to do some math about your own life. You're going to have to count the cost. And when you do count the cost, you're going to come to realize you don't have enough. You're going to realize no matter what calculator you use, you're not good enough. You don't measure up. No matter how you work the numbers, you can't do the right thing with the right heart all the time for the rest of your life. Some of you think you can because you're still in your 20s. <laughs> but you can't. And I think that's exactly what he wants you to realize. I think when you sit down and you honestly pay attention to what Jesus is asking and what he's saying and what the call means, you're going to realize, I can't measure up. I can't do this. And that's precisely where he wants you to be. Because when you come to that realization, I think Jesus says, okay, now we can work together. That's disciple material right there. Now you're ready. Because the call to be with him is always accompanied by a promise. The promise that he will be with us. You know, in, in Luke 18, verses 26 to 27, Jesus says, those who heard it said, who can be saved? And they're referring here when Jesus says a rich man can't come into heaven, but it's easier for an eye, a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich person to get into heaven. The people go, well, well then we're all in trouble because they associated riches with God's blessing. And Jesus says, you're right. You can't do that on your own. But what's impossible with man is possible with God. What Jesus wants is for you and I to hear clearly his call to come out from the crowd and to count the cost and examine our lives and realize we don't measure up. And then he says, exactly. Those are the kind of people I want that recognize their own brokenness and their own failings. Those are the ones I can work with. Because the call to be with him is followed by, right next to it, the promise that he will be with us. Let me read to you from Jesus' words in Matthew Chapter 28, 18 to 20, this is the end of the story before he ascends to heaven. He says, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples, remember what that means, followers, those with him, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, let's read this together, I am with you always to the end of the age. He's with you, always, to the very end. Jesus doesn't just say, yeah, give up everything and follow me and we'll see if you can get it done, right? We'll see if you measure up. He says, when you come to realize you can't, I'm with you. I'm with you. I know you can't. That's why I came. I'm with you. The Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, this is a, like a life verse for me. He says, it is no, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. But Christ lives in me, and the life I live in the flesh, in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Friends, there's an identity worth building your life around. The life I live is not my own life. On my own life, I don't measure up. On my own life, I fall short. On my own life, I screw up. I'm unforgiving, I'm unloving, I'm selfish, and I'm constantly a disaster. After last night's sermon, this woman came up to me in tears and said, I'm such a dope. <laughs> 
I said, we're all spiritual dopes, you know. But it's not my life. It's his life in me. That's what he wants to give you, his life, invite you into, the life that you live. You live by faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. You know what the church is, really? We get right down to what the church is. It's not a big stadium service. It's not a a bunch of campuses. These are just the mechanisms of doing what God's called us to do. The church is a collection of people who get that. The life we live. We live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. That's an identity worth making the center of your heart, your ultimate allegiance, your, your love of all loves, your first love. When you get that, all the other loves fall into their proper place in your life. But you get that wrong, it's just a recipe for misery. So as we go through this series with Jesus, let's start there. It's not an easy call. It's not a part-time thing, but it's worth everything. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this very difficult passage. It would be easy to skip over or explain away, but I think you want us to squirm a bit, to wrestle through our misunderstandings of who you are, to come to see that the life you are offering us, inviting us into, is not our vision of the good life, It's your life, life lived by faith in your son Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us. We're all in process, God, and none of us are perfect, but I pray that you'd begin to work on our hearts that we would want that life above all others. We pray this in your name. Amen.